fantastic. Um, <laughs> so last time I was here, I read a piece of a, a book that I've been working on. It is about a uh, closeted gay teenager who um, has, I, he's a witch, he doesn't know that he's a witch, uh, and he is kind of tricked by somebody that he has a crush on uh, into like meeting after dark, and then he gets his ass kicked, which is very sad. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of continue from that, from, oh, no, I didn't do anything. I didn't explain it right. Um, after he gets his ass kicked, he has this kind of weird vision, and then he opens his eyes, and then the person that tricked him is like swinging from a tree dead. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I'll continue from there. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> do you know anything about what happened to Jake Morris? August's eyes only left the table in front of him to make sure Detective Rosenthal and his meat partner were still staring at him. They were. Uh, three days had passed since the night at the creek. Most of his wounds from that night had healed. His eyes, his eye was still a little bruised. He shook his head. Nope, I, I barely knew that guy. <laughs> Detective Rosenthal nodded slowly and then tossed a folded piece of paper in front of him. Have you ever seen this before? August didn't need to open it to know exactly what it was. Yeah, yeah, of course I have. It's already a weird letter because you're writing it to a guy, but I think what's a little extra weird is that you wrote it to a guy you barely knew. August sat in silence for a few moments, willing his mind to come up with the correct combination of words that would shed his, this suspicion, but then the door to the principal's office flew open. His Aunt Rachel barged in, hair disheveled, apron covered in grease, eyes wild with anger. What the hell do you think you're doing? <laughs> Detective Rosenthal appraised her. Who is this? He asked Principal Jones. I'm his fucking guardian. That's, that's who I am. You know, the person that you're supposed to contact before you start questioning him. Detective Rosenthal snorted and rolled his eyes. Ma'am, we are just having a conversation. His partner, Detective Green, shifted uncomfortably and tried to look away. Is he under arrest? Rosenthal looked like he wanted to say yes, but he couldn't. Great, then we're free to leave, Aunt Rachel said. August, grab your stuff and let's go. August didn't think twice. He yanked his backpack up off the ground and hurried out through the door. Aunt Rachel uttered some colorful words and slammed the door behind her. Are you okay? Yeah. It wasn't until they were sitting in the driveway back at home that she took a deep breath and turned to look, out of, look at him. August, what the hell happened with that boy? He couldn't avoid it anymore. The following day at school, August wondered what would happen when he came across Jake Morris's friends throughout the day, but he never did. No one saw those boys for weeks. Missing posters went up, sad announcements over the PA regarding community searches. The emptiness from the space they once consumed was filled with frantic rumors. Some said it was a, a botched suicide pact. Some said it was a brutal fight. Some said it was just boys being boys. The police remained tight-lipped, which only served to fertilize the seeds of doubt planted in the back of everyone's minds. Detective Rosenthal and Green would formally question August once more, this time with Aunt Rachel present, but ultimately concluded there was no way a boy who weighed about as much as a wet towel could have harmed Jake Morris and his friends, especially not while unconscious on allergy medications, as she insisted. With no one to disprove his alibi and nothing beyond a love note, the conversation came to a close. When the students at his school found out that the police were asking August and his aunt questions, however, a new batch of rumors came, uh, started up. Cruel ones, dark ones, ones uncomfortably close to reality. He found folded up notes, notes that all looked like his own, in his locker and in his chair when he came back from the bathroom and taped to his bicycle, and they all offered the very same message. Murderer. No one could agree on exactly how August had murdered Jake Morris or his friends either, but that didn't stop creative minds from circulating graphic ideas. The one most everyone seemed to agree upon was that August had pricked Jake with a used needle, given him some uncurable disease, and manipulated the boy into suicide. That hurt more than the reality. The rumors followed him home, but August did everything in his power to prevent Aunt Rachel from finding out. He cleaned the rotten eggs that were pelted against his windows. He hid the notes that they wedged into the cracks in his door. Aunt Rachel knew August had been wrapped up with Jake to some extent, but how could he possibly tell her the truth? He didn't believe for a second that she would turn him over to the police, but he was terrified that the guilt would weigh down upon her, that it would be some sort of indication that despite her best efforts, she was a failure for a guardian and that he'd let that, uh, that she had let his mother down until she did something drastic. He endured those cruel words for what felt like an eternity. Little by little, the 16-year-old went from a smiling, good-natured boy to one that seldom had a kind expression to offer. He grew distrusting, constantly waiting for the next attack, whether it was verbal or physical or something worse. Instead of nurturing his creativity or his interconnectedness, August sharpened his intuition and his wit. 
Eventually, there was no hiding from Aunt Rachel anymore. She could only watch as the nephew, as her nephew became the town's pariah, the one responsible for killing its golden boy, and this ate at her too. It was a stormy afternoon that it picked the Adams household and spun it on its head. The house was permeated with a stubborn scent of burning bacon. Aunt Rachel had slept through her alarm and had her hair up in that messy bun that warned August to keep his distance. <laughs> and the roof was leaking. Three steady knocks came to the front door. Aunt Rachel and August swapped glances like they'd both been anticipating this. She must have seen the fear in his eyes because she exhaled especially loudly and summoned the courage to answer the door. Standing at the threshold was the mate detective Green, dark eyes peering at her beneath a drenched newspaper he used to shield himself from the rain. Aunt Rachel rolled her, up, rolled her eyes. What do you want? He looked up at the newspaper, which was beginning to separate into chunks of unrecognizable slop. Can I come in? There was an unease in his voice, like maybe he wasn't supposed to be there. She seemed to search herself for a moment before stepping to the side. Thanks, he said, crumpling the newspaper up into his hand and leaving it by the door. Sorry. He stepped in and he noticed August at the table holding up a spoonful of cereal he forgot he was too preoccupied to remember he was holding. Even in August. What are you doing here, August dared. I shouldn't be here, Detective Green started, glancing over at their front window. I really shouldn't be here. Then why are you, Rachel asked, folding her arms. I always wanted to be a cop since I was just a little boy. I'd sit in my pappy's lap and watch Magnum P.I. on the TV and dream about catching bad guys. <laughs> Doing the right thing. Helping innocent people. This is a weird way to start a conversation, August Buddy. But it didn't stay so simple growing up. Inside Detective Green's eyes, August could almost see the little kid Green was describing, head in his hands, battered by the grimness of reality August had been drowning in for the past week. Sometimes the law is so focused on getting even, they don't mind what happens in the process. What are you trying to get at, Aunt Rachel asked. And sometimes that oath we take don't mean nothing to them. They'll look out for their own and the people who line their pockets before doing the right thing. Is, is, that, is that what's happening right now? Detective Green finally made eye contact with Aunt Rachel. He looked like he was about to betray everyone he ever trusted. Do you know who our sheriff is? Um, no, I don't, I don't really get into politics, Aunt Rachel said. Sheriff J. Wyatt Patterson. He waited for Rachel to make some sort of connection. I guess couldn't figure it out either. Sheriff J. Wyatt Patterson, second cousin of Mary Jean Reagan. Oh. <laughs> Mary Jean Reagan is Jake Morris's aunt. August felt a cold chill rush over him. I was getting ready to go to my knitting class after work yesterday. Bust enough tra uh, buttons on your trousers and you'll go to knitting class too. When I bust a button on my trousers, then I stopped to get my knitting kit out of my desk. And I overheard people talking real quiet like in the sheriff's office. Now normally I'm not an eavesdropper. My mama told me if you eavesdrop, then Jesus is liable to come in the night and slice your ears clean off. <laughs> But I heard them mention August's name, and that's my case too, so I figured I had a right to know. What did they say, Detective? Aunt Rachel asked. You can call me Oliver. A smitten look flashed across his features at the sudden sign of respect. What did they say, Oliver? The sound of his name pulled his thin lips into a meek smile. They said the Morris family was angry, that they knew you had something to do with it, and even though we couldn't prove it, they'd be happy to make a generous donation to make sure that anything that happened to August in the future stayed under the radar. What did the sheriff say, August interjected, his entire body tense now with worry. Detective Green looked grimly in August's direction. I came here to warn you both, you gotta get out of here. Rachel balked at the suggestion. What, but, but you, you heard this conversation, can't you stop them? He shook his head. The more I started digging, the worse the situation got. It turns out the last few people that went up against the Morris family ended up moving far away, and I'm starting to think they didn't move at all. They're not just fancy supplier tycoons, they're crooks, the whole lot of them. Racketeering, drug traders, hitmen, they have reach across this entire country and they hold a mean grudge and I think they're gonna try to hurt you. Rachel plopped down on the sofa. She held her head in her hands. It was her, um, I can't wrap my head around this expression. I can't wrap my head around this, she said. Detective Green came over and he sat beside her. He extended something in her direction and placed another hand on her thigh. She moved the hand off of her thigh. <laughs> Take this pack a bag and leave. 
August stood and he saw what it was in his hand. It was a gray cell phone that looked like it had been salvaged from the early 2000s. What is this? She said, it's Kyle the Burner from... <laughs> For several moments, August, Aunt Rachel, and Detective Green sat in silence. Why are you doing this, Aunt Rachel asked. He shrugged with defeat. Magnum P.I. would have helped innocent people. Moments later, he left through the back door. Stay safe. Once they were alone, August and Aunt Rachel discussed whether or not there was a possibility that with Detective Green was even remotely close to the truth. He didn't strike them as a particularly malicious human being, but what if this was all just some setup? What if the Morris family was trying to get August to run away to imply guilt? They decided to table the discussion for the evening and try to get some rest. Tomorrow, they could make a decision, they said. But tomorrow would already be too late. Thank you. Mm -hmm.